Hi, um, I'm Wayne Madison. I've been collecting jumping spiders for about 43 years, uh, and I want to show you today how to do it, how to find jumping spiders in different habitats uh, using different techniques. So I'm going to uh, show you my equipment uh, and uh, how we go about finding it. Right now, I'm on the coast of British Columbia, and it's April, so it's a little bit cool. We're not likely to find any spiders. Um, but we're also in an area with a lot of traffic, so you'll hear a lot of background noise, and I hope you can still follow it. I'm in my full field gear uh, with my hat for the sun and the rain, and my beating stick and everything else, and I'll show you piece by piece what I go with. Um, so the first and most vital set uh, pieces of equipment are the vials to put the spiders in. I tend to prefer glass vials because uh, I can see through them clearly and look at the spiders with my hand lens that's around my neck here. Um, uh, this by the way on my hand lens is a little bright whistle. It's bright colored so I don't lose the hand lens if it comes off and it's a whistle for safety reasons in case I get lost in the whistle. So the glass vials uh, I also like because I can get fairly small ones. You may prefer plastic vials, uh, but I like glass. So, and they're cork topped because that means that it's really easy for me to open them. If I see a spider, I can open it up like this, I can over it like this without taking my eyes off of the spider. And I have an arrangement of two pockets. Here, uh, I've got one pocket on the right and one pocket on the left. This is for empty vials. This is for full vials with the spiders. And the reason I do this, two separate ones very clearly separated, is that when I see a spider, I don't want to take my eyes off the spider. I want to just, without looking, find a vial, collect the spider, and put it back and be ready for the next spider. So you don't need to use these sorts of pockets. You can get whatever sort of pocket or pouch that hangs on your belt that you can find. Okay, so those are the vials and the pouches. Next, we've got bits of extra equipment like GPS. Take data and also keep your starting waypoints so uh, you don't get lost. I tend to have uh, a little headlamp for security reasons and to look for spiders in dark places. Extra batteries, etc. in here, pencils, things to take notes. I've shown you my hand lens. And then I've got what is one of the most important pieces of equipment, which is the beading sheet in here. Now a beading sheet uh, is used for many things, including beading vegetation. And there are ones that are sold. There are very various uh, equipment companies but this is one that we've made up, uh, and I like it like this because the tent poles uh, can be taken apart and you can put the whole thing in your backpack, and then you can extend it out to make a beading sheet. There are two types of cloth that we use for the beading sheet, and I'll show you in a minute how you might make your own beading sheet. The one type of cloth is fairly rough like this. The texture is, uh, it's very strong, but it's, it's smooth, but not, uh, not waterproof, uh, not really smooth. And I tend to like these for drier areas uh, and beating on vegetation, because then the spiders don't roll off so quickly. But if you're working in wet areas, tropical areas, where water is often a problem, or if you're doing things in leaf litter, it's good to have a, a, a nylon thing that will shed the water and the dirt very quickly. So I sometimes take both sorts with me. So here's the beading sheet, all made up, uh, and um, it has this little pocket to receive the poles. We tend to put a short pocket on one side, a long pocket on the other side, because 
just in case the poles are a little bit too big or too small, or the sheet is a little bit too uh, uh, tense or a little bit too loose, you can decide which side you put it on, because in this side it's easier to get out, on this side it stays in better. So that's the beading sheet, and I will demonstrate it to you in a little bit how it works. So to a jumping spider, a habitat like this is many habitats. They're small enough that there are ground dwellers that live in specific sorts of ground habitats, there are foliage dwellers, there are tree trunk dwellers, there are branch dwellers. So as you collect, you need to be thinking about all the different types of microhabitats and look, if you can, in each. So this is my beading stick, this is the sheet. You can use the beading stick to whack the vegetation. When you whack it, the spiders fall on here and then you just reach in, get your vial, and there you've got the spider. I didn't actually get a spider, I'll put the vial back. Um, so, uh, there are a couple of things to think about as you do this. One is that the first strike is important. It has to be strong because if you just go, oh my gosh, there's a spider, a jumping spider. We just got one. Phaneus albiolus. So when you first strike, the spider, if you just do a weak strike, will just probably hang on, and then the next time you hit it again, it's already hanging on. But if you give a really good whack the first time, the spider uh, falls before it knows what's going on. Sometimes it's better to shake, sometimes to beat. You want to get under, well, a good clump of vegetation. And when you go like this, you don't want the vegetation if you can avoid it, to hit the sheet. Because as it hits the sheet, it'll probably make the sheet bounce and things will go up. So as you beat, you can look for lush pieces of vegetation, many leaves, some flowers, some vines, all in a big piece. A happy bush, I tend to call them, because they tend to be full of insects and often many spiders. You can also, though, look for different sorts of trees and bushes. And so trees and bushes that have open branches like this, especially if there's rough bark, can have special species of jumping spiders. So beating these, or moving your hands over the barks, or a brush over the bark, can find other things. So a special habitat for some salticids, especially in warmer climates, deserts or other places, um, are grass clumps. And they tend to hold species that are specific to grass, or that are special sorts of litter dwellers. And what you can do there is uh, put your beading sheet very quickly under the grass clump and then pull it very quickly and shake. And you're trying to get into the litter and pull it out, as well as lean the grasses over top and shake them. And then you pull it out and you look. And you might wonder, why do I have this stick full of colors? Um, the reason is, it's a very special piece of wood. This wood is very dense. Uh, it's uh, very hard and strong. And because it's dense, it's heavy. So when I strike, there's a lot of momentum here. Because it's heavy and strong, it does a better job. And so I don't want to lose this stick. That's why it's got colors. because. You go like this, you see a great spider, you drop the stick, you get your vial, always with your eyes on the spider, you get it, put the spider in, and then you try to find your stick. And sometimes it can be hard to find, but with the colors, it's great. That's why I have colors on everything, so I don't lose them. Well, here's the male of the Phaneus albiolus that I just uh, collected. Uh, you can see him here. 
One of the reasons that I collect in the glass vials is so that I can see what I got with a hand lens. And many people collect spiders straight into alcohol. I tend to collect them all alive uh, uh, for two reasons. One is that I may realize later that there are juveniles that I want to raise to adulthood, but also I want to take photographs of them alive later. If you pay attention to them as they're alive and as you're collecting as to what you're finding, if you say, oh, that's something I haven't seen before, it allows you then to focus on looking for more of that special thing. And then as you collect in an area, you are adapting to what you find to focus your efforts on where you're finding good things. So for me, collecting tends to be this learning experience as I'm learning about the spiders and their habitats and thinking about what does it look like I've got, trying to identify them alive as much as I can. Uh, as you're looking at the male Phaneas albiolus here, you'll be noticing my gloves. The reason I use fingerless gloves, fingerless so that I can continue to manipulate the vials well, but the gloves, because as I'm beating, or as I'm going into the leaf litter, I'm often having to go into bushes that have thorns or I don't know what's in there. And normally, even with these, I come out after the day full of blood and it would be much worse if I didn't have these gloves. So these gloves are really useful for me to, to save my hands as I go. Uh, one of the things that I find is that the days that I come back, the dirtiest and the bloodiest, are the days that I got the most. In other words, those are the days when I was most intensely working on trying to find as many spiders as I can find. So now I'll show you how to collect on open sunny ground like this, which is a favorite habitat of Habernatus, Psittacus, Eluralis, Muratus, uh, Phlegra, Pelinis, different things in different parts of the world. Uh, and um, they tend to like ground that is fairly well drained, uh, perhaps with rocks, perhaps with sticks, perhaps with leaves. The way that you go about this is simply to look typically, and so you you scan the ground, but exactly how you scan the ground is, is quite a trick because you need to be focused all the time. You can't let your eyes wander. You have to be thinking about the spider and imagining where it might be sitting and looking with your eyes over all the different spots. But also, as you step, you may scare them up a little bit. So your eyes tend to uh, move close to your feet as you step and then farther away and then close to your feet as you step and then farther away. And so you're constantly scanning and see what you can find. Sometimes you simply see the spider sunbathing on top and so it's the form. Sometimes it's the motion that you see. And as you practice you'll get good at uh, spotting both. It turns out that uh, different, in different conditions you'll get males or females coming out or juveniles at different times of the day. Males tend to come out when it's a little bit warmer. Males tend to be easier to see than females. They tend to be dark or brightly colored, and they tend to move more. Uh, so if it's a time of the day where you're looking for males, uh, you tend to be able to spot them from farther, and so you can walk more quickly. If it's a time of the day when there might be more females or juveniles, you tend to have to spend more time looking more closely and so, when you're looking for females or juveniles, sometimes you find you end up walking on the ground because they can be very hard to spot. Um, you can often crawl to look for them. So one of the tricks with looking for things on open ground is uh, to decide which direction you're going to move because you don't want your shadow to fall on the specimen, not so much that it'll move or get scared, but just that they're harder to see. So you tend to walk into the sun with your shadow behind you, and it's often easier to walk uphill rather than downhill because as you walk uphill, you get to look more closely uh, at the ground. Your eyes are closer. One thing you'll discover is that species that live on the ground, just as things that live on vegetation or tree trunks, are very specific about what type of substrate they like. So some species might prefer the rocks with sand. Others might prefer grassier areas. Uh, others might prefer where it's more solid, dry leaf litter, um, and so you'll get to know which species prefer what exact microhabitat.
what do you do if you see a spider? Well, it depends a little bit upon what species. Some things like Phlegra tend to quickly dash under things. They're a little bit hard to get. Others, like many Habernatus, will just sit there continuing to sunbathe. And so with those, you can just slowly come like this. They won't see the vial, perhaps, and then last minute like this, and then like that. Sometimes, though, there's actually no spider here. Sometimes, though, they'll be crawling into things, and you have to dive down. And whether you are patient and wait, or whether you dive down, is a decision you'll just have to make. And it's not very easy sometimes, because when you dive down, they could sneak away, and you'll be looking here, and they might be far away. Here I am in a forest with the leaf litter here. Um, leaf litter, chrysalticids, is a, a really important habitat, especially in tropical forests. Deserts it can be if there are trees and so forth. Uh, in temperate zones, where it's fairly cool, there tend not to be too many salticids on forest leaf litter, shaded forest, because it's just a bit too cold. Uh, but in the tropics, it's amazing. Uh, and there are species that live just in this sort of habitat. And the way to look is uh, a couple of different ways. One is to look just as we did on open sunny ground. So you're just looking. And often they're very tiny ones, so you're often crawling. Um, but many of them are hard to find that way. Uh, they might be just underneath uh, the leaves. For the ones that are just underneath the leaves, uh, I tend to use a beading sheet. I bring this out again. Uh, and um, a simple way, fairly crude, is just to grab a batch of litter, put it on here, shake it a bit, and then pull it aside and look for the spiders uh, running away. Uh, many people who collect spiders and litter do other things like collect big pieces and put them into extraction funnels. And that can work too. Um, I tend to like to do it this way because it gives me very quick feedback as to whether the spiders are here. And I can then learn, moment by moment, whether it's better to go to that sort of litter or that sort of litter. Uh, some of the most interesting jumping spiders tend to be where the litter is fairly deep but well drained. So if there's pockets on a slope, for instance, with, with litter that's uh, got humidity but is not soaking wet, uh, that can be great. As you're doing this, you have to be careful, of course, uh, for uh, snakes and scorpions and centipedes. Uh, so some of you may prefer uh, to have either full gloves or to do it with some tools. Uh, I tend to just use my uh, regular hands with gloves. In many places of the world, tree trunks can be a very special habitat for jumping spiders. Uh, the bark has places for them to hide underneath and so forth. So one way to collect jumping spiders is to actually peel the bark and look for the spiders underneath. Another way is to simply look uh, to see if you can see the spider. Many of them on tree trunks are very cryptic. They're hard to see. And the third way to find jumping spiders on tree trunks is to use a brush and basically brush them off. But when you do any of these, it's a good idea to be prepared for the spiders falling. So this is where I use the beading sheet again by putting it under here and for instance, like this. Now whether it's better to look or to brush depends upon your eyesight, how difficult the spiders to see, and so forth. Often it's better just to look, but brushing can be very good for small, difficult to see jumping spiders. Now this is an example of how much used this beading sheet is. We've seen it with the tree trunks. We've seen it used with the leaf litter. We saw it used with the beading. It can be an umbrella. It can be a picnic blanket. It can be something to keep you warm a little bit. It's a very useful thing to have. So I mentioned that I take a GPS to take uh, good uh, locality readings. Um, and uh, when you take the readings, you have to think, well, how far can I walk before it's a new locality? 
certainly if you go a kilometer, it's best to treat it as a new locality. Um, typically, if I go about 200 or 300 meters, I'll treat it as a new locality. So you need to take those records and you need to somehow keep a notebook or somehow knowing what's the connection between this record here and the latitude and longitude and the, uh, and, uh, the specimens. Uh, by the way, please decimal degrees, uh, no minutes and seconds. Um, so once you've collected an area though, you've got your spiders here, uh, you want to separate them so that when you go to the next locality, you keep the two localities separate. You know who belongs to which locality. So typically, after I've collected in an area, I will get the specimens out, put them in a Ziploc bag, put a little note inside as to which ones these were, and put them back, and then I can continue to collect from empty to full. So uh, we're just about done showing you how to collect jumping spiders. Um, I uh, just wanted to say something about clothes, as of course you can wear what clothes you're comfortable in, but it's important that you feel comfortable uh, crashing into bushes, having thorns go by you, scrambling up uh, rocky uh, hills and so forth. In other words, wear things that protect you well. I like tall boots that I can tuck things into. The boots good, give good ankle support, uh, long uh, pants so that I can be in cactus and so forth, uh, long sleeve shirt not only for sun protection but also against plants and so forth. Uh, basically uh, nice pockets here, pockets everywhere. As a summary before we go, uh, here are some of the key pieces of equipment uh, to bring. Vials of course, usually many more than this on a, on a good day I'll probably use up about a hundred vials or so. Um, uh, GPS, the pockets of various sorts for your vials, um, the uh, gloves, a brush, which is sort of a secondary piece, I don't use that too often, um, the uh, Ziploc bags for uh, holding the vials, and then the all-important beading stick and uh, beading sheet. And there we go. Good luck. Recording. Well, hello. I want to show you today how to collect jumping spiders. Salticity. Bright whistle. It's bright colors. Go, oh my gosh, there's a spider. A jumping spider. Just use a brush. Let's go. <laughs>